Tonight we approach the memory of the sacrifice of the Son of God as offenders, being delivered by the offended. And I'm wanting us to think along those lines. When we are looking at the gospel, there, there are vantage points and there are different uh, ideas that are emphasized depending on how you approach the gospel, how you look at the gospel. Tonight, I want us to look at it as offenders loved by the offended or the offended delivering the offender. And I, I want you to think in those terms. We are the offenders and the offended has done something. The offended, not the offended. Fender, the offended, is the one who has reached out to us. Ephesians 2, and you who were dead in trespasses and sin. You see, hath he quickened is in those crooked letters, those italicized letters. It's actually added by the translators, the King James. This is the King James, of course, but... Uh, it is stated later, and we'll pick it up in verse 5, but they inserted it here in, in the translation. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. The point of emphasis here is who you are, who you are by nature, dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein, he's not finished, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among, among whom also, we all had our conversation. I appreciate that wording because it tells us that Paul is not talking about some special group in Ephesus. He's talking about all of us. If you have been made alive in Christ, this is describing you. He says we. He includes himself. He wasn't like the dirty, nasty, heathen Gentiles. He was a Jew. But when he came alive, uh, he came to see himself as he really was before God, an offender. Among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So this was the condition that we were in were not, was not just an external condition. It was a condition that went to the very mind, to the very thought process, to our inwardmost being. We were corrupted. That's the way we were by nature. We were born that way. And we lived that way, expressed in different ways in different ways but still that that's that is the description of us all before we were made alive but god who is rich in mercy the offended but god who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the amazing truth of exceedingly abundant grace. There's nothing more life-impacting than a body of believers truly fellowshipping deeply together in the body and blood of our Savior. Fellowshipping deeply together, entering in deeply together 
in the body and blood of our Savior. Not just a theory, but mutually encouraged in the Redeemer. There is really nothing that moves a true believer more than that. And I guess I could say it this way, there's nothing that should move a believer more than that. So tonight I want us to meditate for a little bit. As offenders, receiving grace from the offended. And the first point is this, the offended initiated reconciliation. The offended initiated reconciliation. You know that already, don't you? You need to think about it. We need to dwell on that. That needs to sink deep into our souls. I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Familiar verses that we'll look at tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be moving to different portions of Scripture as these points are made. But don't let the familiarity of the Scriptures dull their significance. And all things are of God, verse 18, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. But it's God who has reconciled us to himself. And, and it goes like this. To wit, that God was in Christ. Reconciling the world unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though... God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. For he hath made him sin for us. You see, to be is in italicized words. Sometimes the impact of a scripture comes more strongly when you leave the italicized words out. Sometimes the italicized words really do add and help in the understanding. Sometimes it's more impactful to just leave them alone. For he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 1 John 4 and verse 10 Herein is love, not that we loved God. We're saying the offended initiated reconciliation. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. So God is the offended. Our Creator, not one of our peers, God, is the offended. And God determined to reconcile the world unto himself. He didn't ask for our input. He didn't ask for our approval. It is his eternal purpose. He initiated it. He determined this. For reasons found within himself. I've heard hardened sinners rebelliously say when we are preaching the gospel perhaps out on the streets and they'll say, I didn't ask him to do anything for me. See, we're making much of the cross. We're making much of what Christ did. And they mockingly shoot back, I didn't ask him to do anything. And you know what? They're absolutely right. But such blindness can't see the goodness and the mercy and the love of God. 
Fact is, none of us asked him. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I am the offender. And yet he, the offended, determined his own humiliation and death to reconcile me to himself. I had nothing to do with my reconciliation to God. God reconciled me in Christ. God did that. Initiated by Him. Secondly, the offended purchased redemption. The offended, the offended paid the, not the offender. The offender didn't pay a price. The offended paid the price. The offended purchased redemption. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Who gave him, this is talking about the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The great God and our Savior, the offended gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Peter says it this way. First Peter chapter 1. And verse 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your conduct of life that was trapped in the traditions of your fathers, or as he, the translation says, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but... With the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He's not the offender. He's the offended, without blemish, without spot. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God. That raised him from the dead, gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. In chapter 3, Peter says this, verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, the offended for the offender, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, by the Spirit. An infinitely high price had to be paid to cover the debt owed in God's court of justice. He, the judge, paid the debt. A debt I could not pay. A debt he did not owe. Isn't that amazing grace? I, the offender, Drink a cup that is sweet. As you drink that cup tonight, there is a sweetness to that juice you'll be drinking. Remember as you drink that sweet cup that the offended drank a very bitter cup so that you could drink that sweet cup. I, the offender, am loved by the offended in spite of my offense. There's nothing that I can do to change the fact that I am an offender. I can't change that. I, I need the offended to step in and save the day, as it were. I cannot change who I am in relationship to Him. But the, offender, the offended loved me, the offender. I, the offender, am redeemed 
I'm free. I'm not condemned. I'm forgiven. I'm blessed. I'm adopted. Really infinite blessings that we are just now in this lifetime as regenerate people able to peer into and grasp and understand to some degree. But there's far more to be known and seen when the revelation of Jesus Christ comes, when the return of Christ and, and all of the, the things that get in our way of seeing as clearly as we will see. But we're, giving, we're given these helps in this lifetime in order to bring us to contemplate and by the aid of the Holy Spirit to see and appreciate what we have in Christ as offenders, the offended purchased our redemption. Thirdly, the offended, the offended pursues the offender. Think about that. That's abnormal in our human experience, isn't it? The offended pursuing the offender. But that's exactly what has happened with us. And you see that, for example, John chapter 10. We are, we are pictured in the Scriptures as sheep. And you remember what Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We've gone our own way. We're wandering sheep. But there is a shepherd. The offended shepherd comes for his sheep. The offenders, John 10 Verse 15, as the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Jesus prayed to his Father. He said, all, all authority is given me, and all power is given me in heaven and in earth, that I might give eternal life to as many as you've given me. He pursues. Matthew 18. Jesus says this concerning a lost sheep. How thank ye, how think ye, if a man have an hundred sheep, and one of them be gone astray, does he not leave the ninety and nine, and does he not go into the mountains and Seek that which is gone astray. Isn't that what a shepherd does? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoices more over that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. He pursues. Luke 19.10 Jesus, it is said of Jesus, He came to seek and to save. Seek and to save that which was lost. The pursuer. Where would you be if He had not pursued you? Adam and Eve hid. And you would have continued hiding too. And God came to them. God's word says there's none that seeks after God. None. We're in trouble. If he doesn't pursue, we're in trouble. I think it's Legitimate to pray when we're praying for those that we have a burden for. Pray to God to pursue them. If He doesn't, if He lets them go, they'll be lost forever. But 
But God's love is that amazing coming to us. And as we're joining together tonight to be encouraged in the body and blood of Christ, we're thinking about this, God's love to us. It, it's that amazing coming to us in our rebellion and rescuing us from certain destruction. He could have justly refused you. He could have just let you go. But instead, he sought you and found you. I, the offender, loved by the offended, pursued by the offended, won by the offended. He forgives my offense. And he doesn't, as I read the scriptures, it doesn't say, I, there are some people that seem to think otherwise, but as I read the scriptures, I don't think that the offended wants me, the offender, wallowing in my guilt. He wants to see me rejoicing. Isn't that amazing? That's one of the ways that we know with an offended, offender relationship that something good is going on is when there is joy and that the offended is not hanging the guilt over the repentant offender. There's joy. Even in the offended. Have you? Have you read Zephaniah recently? The Lord, Zephaniah 317. The Lord, thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will say he will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. He's talking about the offender, the offended, will rejoice over the offender. In the salvation of the offender. Think about that tonight as you eat that bread and drink that cup. The offended pursued you. And then finally, the offender is changed by the offended. The offended does everything that we have said heretofore. But he does something else very practically. He doesn't leave us as he found us. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. New creation. There's creative work that's gone on. Something internally has happened. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Ephesians 4, 24. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. He's done something in in you. He does not leave us as he finds us. He washes us. He dresses us. He, he transforms us from the inside out. You can read a description of that in Ezekiel. I'm forgetting the chapter now. He's talking about Jerusalem and how he found Jerusalem and washed and cleaned up and dressed up with incredibly beautiful ornaments. God did that. 1 Corinthians 6, you remember the testimony of Paul of these saints at Corinth when he gives that list of sins. And the list could have been expanded, no doubt. But he says, such were some of you in verse 11. But you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. There is a 
a rich and full and free and complete salvation. It actually affects us. It, it, it does something to us. Not it. He does something to us. Because of His great love, He has determined, predestinated, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, He's predestinated us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Doesn't that sound like a guarantee? Nothing can prevent that transformation. So that we hear the Apostle Paul saying, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And then he continues to talk about that grace in Romans chapter 6 and what it does and how it affects us. And then into chapter 7 and 8 and the rest of the book. Because of the grace and love of the one we remember tonight, we have a sure hope, a certain hope, an eternal inheritance with Him. It's guaranteed. And part of that is the perfection of us conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Once outcasts, dead in trespasses and sin, bound by the mindset of this world and under the power of a wicked spirit children of wrath even as others but God but God the offended who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us the offenders even when we were dead in sins hath quickened us together with Christ for by grace you are saved. So tonight we join together to fellowship in the person and work of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Partake with thanksgiving tonight. Don't you have something to be thankful for? If you're a child of God. The offended initiated. Your reconciliation. The offended. Purchased. Your redemption. The offended. Pursued you. The offender. And the. Offended. Is continuing his work of change. In you, the offender, you're not what you once were. And you're not what you will be, as they say. But we're conformed to, we're predestined to be that, to be conformed. And the process has already begun, hasn't it? And may our partaking together tonight as we dwell upon our Savior, may it have a sanctifying effect upon us. Examine yourselves tonight. Examine yourselves. Who are you? What is your relationship to Christ tonight? And what is your relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Where do you stand? Examine yourselves. And then partake. Partake with the understanding of what is represented in that bread and in that cup, that one bread, the fellowship that we have together as a body of believers, and then that one cup we share in the cleansing of the Lord Jesus Christ together. May the Lord, may the Holy Spirit help us tonight as we partake together. to truly fellowship in the body and blood of Christ. Let's pray.